enough to go to God's word this morning? Okay, then just for fun and out of reverence for his word, will you stand to your feet for just a minute? Let's pray as we prepare to go to God's word. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity. May it never become old news for us that we get, we have the privilege of coming before you. We have the privilege of gathering together to hear your word, to celebrate Jesus together. Lord, we thank you for that. And now, Lord, I ask that you would give each one of us ears to hear what your Holy Spirit wants to speak to us. God, I pray that today you would give us heavenly downloads. God, I pray you as the lift of our head, you would lift people's head and encourage them today. God, let each one of us, I pray, even as we heard in that video, may we feel and experience the joy and love of God in our lives today. God, I pray this and I thank you for it in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated this morning. Um, I love this time of year. I know that everybody doesn't. For some, I know that for some of you, uh, Christmas this year means it's the first. It's the first. They're not there. The first having to get through it when there's been a loss. For some, Christmas is hard because, honestly, your family is so dysfunctional, and you know it, that you dread getting together with people. So I know for some, it's hard. Uh, And if that's you, I want to encourage you today that that can change. And I pray that God does something beautiful inside of you that can cause, from this moment on, Christmas to be something worth celebrating. So that to say, I love Christmas and I love this season. I don't love the snow, but I love the celebration. I don't love the busyness or all the parties, but I love the people. I don't love the food. Yeah, I do. I do love all of the food. (laughs) All of it. Most of it. Renee looked at me like, really? all? Well, there's some vegetables I don't care for. And I hope you enjoy the food because, as you saw in the video, we're about to enter into 21 days of fasting. So enjoy the food while you can. Then we'll kick off the year with 21 days of prayer and fasting. I love that we start out the year that way. So I love Christmas. But what I love most is Jesus because he's the reason for this season. Like he's the reason we're gathered this morning. He's why there's anything to celebrate about. Don't forget that in the busyness and all the hurried stuff. Don't forget the reason. It's not just a cute tagline, the reason for the season. He really is the reason for the season. We find at the very heart of the Christmas narrative, this in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23. Look, the virgin will conceive a child. She will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. God with us. Isn't that what everybody needs to hear? Not God's mad at us. Not God's against us. Not God's forgotten us. But the beauty and the majesty, may we recapture that, the beauty and majesty of these words, God with us. To the person who's been alone, it's good to hear that God is with you. To the one who's lived what most would call a nightmare, it's good to know that God is with you. To the one who was at the funeral you never thought you would be at, it's good to know that God is with you. God is with you is the answer to a million questions. To know God is with you is to know that you're in the majority all the time because God is with you. Just because God is omnipresent. That means God is everywhere. It means you can't get away from him. Have you heard about Jonah? He tried to run from God, and even in a fish's mouth, in his belly, he couldn't get away from him. But catch this. Just because God is everywhere doesn't mean he's experienced by everyone. Did you hear that? You know, some would say, Pastor Kev, why talk about in this series, be present? Why talk about being present before the Lord? Because God's everywhere anyway. Well, he is everywhere, but just because he's everywhere doesn't mean everybody experiences him, right? So we see in Psalm 1611 that in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Well, then why are some people not having joy? If God's presence is everywhere, then shouldn't we all be full of joy, Do you know anybody who's not full of joy? 
I told you guys a few weeks, a few years ago, rather, I went to Walmart. It was the day after Thanksgiving, not in the rush. It was toward the end of the day. I had to pick up just one thing, and I made the mistake of asking the clerk on the way out. I said, hey, how's your day going? And he said, it's the worst day of my life. I mean, he said it like that. He leaned into it. It's the worst day of my life. I thought, oh, I see the joy of the Lord in you. Like, you must be experiencing God's magnificent presence right now. No, some... Even though God's everywhere, they don't experience him, but you can. Is this not the story that Jesus came? God came to the earth wrapped on human skin. God with us. Some people noticed him and loved him. Others hated him and killed him. Yet God was walking among them. This is why it's crazy that you can have two people in the exact same spot and one person experiences God, the other sadly misses him. I think most people live their lives missing God's presence. They miss the experience that they can have with him. I think most live their lives that way. But we don't have to, again, through the sacrifice of Jesus, Jesus coming as God, putting on human flesh, born of the Virgin Mary, that's God wrapping on human skin, so it's 100% God and yet 100% man, Jesus, living his life as a sinless man, then dying vicariously on the cross. That means that he died not for his sins, but for ours. He died in our place. He was buried and three days later rose from the dead. Why? So that God can be with us. We can experience God being with us. That's what I want to talk to you about today. I had a prayer thought this morning. If I only had two things I could ask God for, what would that be? I happened to read through uh, Proverbs early this morning. <clears throat> Excuse me. The writer of Proverbs said, said I, said, I ask only two things of you, Lord, before I die. One is that I won't lie, and secondly, that I won't be too rich or too poor. Those are interesting things to ask. And then I said, well, what would I ask for? If I only had two things, if you only had two things you could ask God for, what would you ask for? Well, is that, that's a good question. As I thought about it, <clears throat> and as I pondered this, instantly something welled up in my heart. Oh, I know what it is. I thought, well, I better pause for it. Maybe there's something else. I waited. No, this, there can't be anything better than this. Lord, here's what it would be. If I only had two things I could ask of you, I would ask, number one, I want to know you to the fullest way possible. To whatever degree is humanly possible, as much as this human frame frame can contain, I want to know you that way. Only humans have the capacity to know and experience God. Like we learn that the word know in the Old Testament that was written in Hebrew means to know by personal experience. It's more than just head knowledge. Like I know about that. It's, it's It's to know him. By personal acquaintance or personal experience. It's the same word that was used when Adam and Eve had sex. It said that Adam knew Eve. It talks about a really intimate relationship. So when the Bible talks about knowing God, it uses that word know. That means to know by intimate acquaintance. So I said, Lord, I couldn't think of anything better out of all that I could ask for other than, number one, I've got to know you. Humans, we're built with a capacity to hear from God. Hang with me on this. That's not just for other people. That's not for the really spiritual kind of people. That's not for those that, that, whatever you think that means. No, we all have the capacity to hear God's voice. We have the capacity to see into a different realm. We have the capacity to walk by faith and to see into a different realm, to see something beyond this world. Pastor God, were you making that up? No, I wouldn't make this up. This is found in the Holy Scriptures. We have the capacity to feel God touch us. The Scriptures say that, that God touched, an angel of the Lord rather touched Daniel when he felt so weak and he was instantly strengthened, right? We know that the Holy Spirit took hold of the prophet Ezekiel. So Lord, I want to, whatever the full capacity that is, Lord, I want to know you that way, that I hear you, that I see you, I can see what you're up to. I want to feel your touch. I want to taste and see that the Lord is good. I even want to smell the fragrance of who you are. You know, people have a smell to them, don't they? Some it's not good, others it's real good. 
I'm trying to encourage you that there is an experience with the Lord that is available to you. And I can't think of any better that I, anything better that I can wrap up this year with other than inviting you to the greatest invitation there could ever be, and that it's an experience with you being present in the Lord's presence. You fully experiencing as, as much as your human body can handle experiencing who he is. I long for that with you. Okay, for you rather. Here we go. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. If you've got your Bibles, let's look to this together. It says this. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can, say that with me, will you say, we can. Yeah, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place. Because of the blood of Jesus. Pause for just a minute. In the, in the Old Covenant, only one person could enter into God's presence. And they did not do that boldly. They did that with fear and trembling. And they could only do that once a year. But now, through the sacrifice of Jesus on our behalf, now we all can boldly go right into his presence. So let us draw near. Let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. It's Hebrews 10, 19, and 22. All of our potential, everything that you think you could possibly ever be in life is all wrapped up in your response to drawing near to God. The best I think I could ever become can, can never be fully tapped into outside of me drawing near to God. I can't, I can't help but to remember that, uh, that picture. I showed it last week. It was drawn by Michelangelo, painted by Michelangelo. It's in the Sistine Chapel in the Vatican. And it's a picture that was meant to depict, or several call it, the creation of man. Meant to depict the moment that God created Adam. But if you see the full picture, you know it's not the creation of Adam. Adam's already alive. In the picture, his eyes are open. He's moving slowly, but he's moving. What the picture depicts is, is not man being created, but man being invited to live life with God. God with us. The picture is riveting to me because it depicts God who is fully twisted over and it appears rushed by angels to get to man. And God is as far stretched out as he can. Notice that God's finger is completely stretched out there. And then Adam's finger if you see the full picture, Adam's just reclining, like kind of laid back, and he's just, he's like this. When I saw that everything within me wanted to grab, grab Adam's arm and say, would you, would you please reach that thing out there? Come on, the full potential of all that you could be is wrapped up in you drawing near to God. He's done everything to, to, everything to stretch himself out to you, so you please just draw near to him. This is important to remember that the great story of the Bible is about God's desire to draw near to you, not about our desire to draw near to him. Like the giant theme, the big narrative of the entire Bible, it's all about God stretching out to you, God stretching out to us, to me, not us trying to somehow reach him. Most of the world, if you ever travel the world, you'll find that most of the world is trying to reach out and find God. They've missed the fact that he's reached out for them. I'll never forget seeing in uh, Cairo, in Egypt, and I walked into this room, and, and hundreds, of, hundreds of men are there, and they're bowing down repeatedly, bowing down, bowing down. And I noticed, uh, I asked our missionary friend, I said, hey, Dick, I said, why is it they've got this, their foreheads are so dirty? He said, oh, it's not because, I thought because they bowed down so much. Oh, it's not because they bowed down so much. They actually put dirt on there so it looks like they bowed down a lot. Because they're trying to make themselves look holy. They're trying to do something to earn what they might think would be God's approval, not even knowing God's the one that is stretched out toward you. And he didn't do it because you were so good and you prayed so much or you looked so holy. No, when we were at our worst, he came running after us. That's the big story in the Bible. God with us. God for us. It's important to never forget that he loved us first. God is always the initiator. Any good thing, even my prayer thought this morning about, Lord, what's the one thing I could ask for to know you more? I wouldn't even have that desire had he not put it there. 
Like anything good in me originates because he put it there. He's the author, he's the starter, and the finisher of our faith. Abolish from your thought. Please, abolish from all of your thoughts the thought that I have to do all these things to get him. No, he's the one that's done all the heavy lifting. All we got to do is reach out and draw near. It's not complicated, but it is intentional. Let us draw near to God means there's something we do have to do. It's true, the foundation of our faith is grace. The foundation of our faith is we receive, we're saved not by our works, but by his grace. The foundation of our faith is we, we, we received what we could never earn, right? That is the foundation of our faith, but that does not exemplify us from having to do anything, right? So then, what is this part we have to play? What do we do then, Pastor Kev, to draw near to God? How do we do that, and what does that look like? Again, the scriptures say, let us draw near to God. If we go one week of our lives without doing something to draw close to God, then we've missed responding to this invitation. It seems like I spent my whole life saying, let's go. As a little boy, I would be like, hey, let's go. Let's go beat up the neighborhood bully. We're all tired of getting beat up. Let's go beat up him. I would say, hey, let's go hang out at Meyer Thrifty Acres, because that used to be the hangout. <laughs> let's go to the church parking lot near their house, and we did, we did bad things there, so I can't say what it was. But let's go do that. <laughs> then eventually it became, hey, let's go to church. Let's go to a Bible study. Let's go run after this vision. Let's together accomplish that dream. But the biggest let's go moment is this moment right here. Let's go into God's presence. There's not a better let's go moment in all of life than, hey, let's go do that. Let's go spend the rest of our lives doing that. How do we do that? Let's talk about that for just a couple of moments. Number one, how do we do that? According to our text today in Hebrews 10, we do that by leaning into community with a family of God. We've got to lean into community with the family of God. The scriptures we read said, we can enter into his presence. So let us boldly enter into his presence and follow this. We follow the scriptures. It also says, let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope that we affirm. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of, good, acts of love and good work. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but rather encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. Therefore, let us moment. What is that telling us? Drawing near to God is something we do, not just independently, not just individually, what we do together, right? Let us draw near to God. A lot of people think, well, that's just what I do privately. I need to have some quiet time, whatever you call that, where I read my Bible, I pray, I connect with God's presence, with God at the beginning of my day, then I carry that conversation the rest of the day with God all day long. That's beautiful, but the scriptures say if you want the fullness of coming to God, you got to do that with other people. Let us, say that with me, we say let us. Let us, man, have your individual time do what you do alone with God, but realize to experience God at the full, at fullest extent possible, the full degree possible, that has to be done in the context of God's family, his community. It is beyond beautiful that through the sacrifice of Christ and my faith in his sacrifice for me on my behalf, not because of anything I did other than placing faith in him, I am made into, you are made into, if you place your faith in Jesus, a child of God. Isn't that something? That means not just a name. You really are a son and daughter of God, which means you're part of a family. There are some things you will never hear God say privately. You'll only hear God say in a public gathering. There are some experiences you will only have with God that you can only have in a corporate gathering. God designed it that way. It's why that since the birth of the church, since the day of Pentecost, the church has gathered. The saints, it is a sacred gathering when the saints gather. And here is God. We're right in the midst of us. That's beautiful. 
So I encourage you, hey, make sure you lean into God's family. Okay, a couple of guys help me out. Will you, Anthony, come up here for just a second, will you please? And uh, Frank, will you come up here? Big Brian, just link arms with me, will you? So the other day, it was a Saturday, we were at men's prayer. And this is really significant because over at Gilead Healing Center, the first Saturday of the month, men gather to do what? To worship together, to learn what it means to be a man of God, how to lead their families. And as we're gathered there, I had a, I had a prayer thought. I said, guys, I want you to do this. I had a few of them stand next to me. I said, just link arms with me. And we stood before the men who on a Saturday morning, perhaps their only day off, they could have been sleeping, they could have been out shopping, they could have been drinking coffee, having, God forbid, donuts. <laughs> but instead, there they were to say, come on, as men, let's worship God together. So this was my prayer thought in the moment. I said, men, link arms. And, as I, and I had a couple of guys stand with me like this, and we stood in front of all the men, and I said, Satan hates this. Yes, he, does. he hates yes, this. He, does. he knows that we are better together. He knows that when we're independent, like we're weak, but when we're together, come on, and we get attacked, we're better off together. Yes, if I've got Brian, who's going to mess with me with Brian on my side, <laughs> right? Come on, say it with me. Say we're better, we're better. Together. together. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Do you know how to tell the difference between a healthy sheep, healthy sheep, and sick sheep? I learned this recently. Only sick sheep isolate. Yeah, only sick sheep. You can tell the health of somebody, you can tell the health of a believer, a follower of Jesus, by how much they want to get together. You can see the unhealth of somebody by how they isolate, how they isolate themselves. Now, we, God made us in such a way that we need each other. We are better. We are stronger together than we ever would be independently. So it's so important that as we talk about what does it look like to draw near to God, we get number one, we lean into this relationship we have with each other. And because we do that, we will be stronger, we will, we will be healthier and we'll experience and hear some things from God that otherwise we wouldn't when we get to gather together. I've had a chance to travel lots of places across the world, and from time to time, I will hear someone speak English in a country that doesn't speak English. And it always grabs my attention. Like, oh, who is that? I, love that. I haven't heard that sound in so long. Let's say I was in Russia right now, and if I heard someone speak English, I would run into the room. Where is that? So, where are you guys from? How did you get here? If I found out that they know about Michigan, oh, you know about snow. Yes. I mean, Michigan snow. If they said, hey, hey, we're going to be here next week, too, if you want to hang out. Don't you think if I was there and I was still there next week, I would absolutely be there. Why? Because I want to be with my people. I want to be with my family. Scripture makes it clear we live in this world as foreigners or aliens. This world has a different culture than the culture of God's kingdom. They've got a totally different set of values than the values of God's kingdom. And so while we live here, and I want to shine as bright as I can while I'm here, I want to represent Jesus best I can while I'm here, I love to be with my people. It is natural to want to be with your people. It's natural to want to be with the people of God. Ephesians 4.16, this is the verse that I most frequently pray for you. It reads this way. He, speaking of Jesus, makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and it's growing and it's full of love. The Apostle Paul, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us this picture that the way God made things is just as a joint, joint and ligaments are meant to be together, not separate from each other. But they're knitly woven together, and as each part does its own part, it makes the whole body healthy. 
This teaches us that the way God made the body of Christ, God's family, is not that we would live dependent of each other, rather independent of each other. Rather, we would be dependent on each other. We would lean into and on each other. And when we do that, caring for somebody else beyond ourselves, helping somebody else grow, then when we do that, oh, it makes the whole family of God, the whole body of Christ, three things, healthy. That's good, isn't it? Growing, that's good, isn't it? And filled with the love of God. All takes place by leaning into community. This tells us that every member counts. Everybody has a part to play. There are no spare parts in the body of Christ. Every member is a minister. And every member is responsible to help some other family member grow. So how do we Together, draw near to God. First, we lean into God's family. I encourage you, even as you go to your life groups tonight, you're leaning, enjoy leaning into that family. Secondly, what do we do? We cultivate an atmosphere that he enjoys. We cultivate an atmosphere that God enjoys. God loves to be with people that have a heart that sincerely follows Jesus. Again, our text today says, let's go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts fully trusting him. God loves to be with people that have a sincere heart and a thankful heart. We can cultivate an atmosphere that he enjoys. Do you know there's an atmosphere God enjoys and an atmosphere he doesn't enjoy? Isn't that true of you? If in your workplace you have a complainer in your office, nobody likes to hang around that person, do they? Right? Right? There's an atmosphere, if you do enjoy that, you need to come up for prayer today. Because it shouldn't be normal that you enjoy that. It's an unenjoyable atmosphere. When we moved, when we moved into our home, maybe about five years ago, I noticed quickly that there was a, a fox that would often come from the backyard into the front yard. And then one day I saw it actually laying in the front yard. Before long I figured out why. I found the den in our front yard, and there was little baby foxes one day. Uh, Jeanette, you and Mark had gotten us those... Uh, those ring device things, we put that on there. And one morning early, I heard that, and I run out, and I look out there, and sure enough, there's little, the little baby foxes are playing on our doorstep. You know, I did the same thing. Oh, it's beautiful. And uh, mom picked them up one by one, said, you guys need to get back home, and took them back home. Then one day, we had some torrential rain. And because that den goes down a hill, well, the rain just happened to go right down into that hole. And that was uncomfortable. So rightly so, mom didn't like that atmosphere, and she picked up one baby at a time, and just, they found another place where there was not rain. Why? Because rain's not a healthy atmosphere. I mean, rain's good, don't get me wrong, but nobody likes to hang out in it, right? I've heard the songs, singing in the rain, I've never seen anybody do that. You know? I see people running out of the rain, I see people like ducking, I don't know why they duck, like it, they think it won't hit them if I duck, but even when I go to my own car, it's like, oh, it's it doesn't help, but it's because we don't like the atmosphere. There's an atmosphere that God enjoys. In you, I, we can cultivate an atmosphere that God enjoys. We can do this in our homes. We can do this in our gathering right here. What if we spent the whole year, next year, cultivating an atmosphere that God enjoys when we gather? Wouldn't that be powerful? Cultivate an atmosphere that he enjoys. Scripture says, for our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. Our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let me ask you this. What is the proper response to somebody whose guilt has been removed? To somebody who felt shamed and that shame has been removed? Somebody who carried for years the fact that they know they've offended God, they know they've sinned, those that have been abused and have for years carried shame. What is the response when you realize that God took that shame off of you? God took that guilt off of you. When you felt stained by what you had done and you realize, I can never get this stain out, but God comes and through the blood of Jesus gets that stain out. Isn't the natural response, thank you. Thank you. Jesus, thank you. That's the atmosphere that God loves. He loves the atmosphere that is filled with the word, thank you. You can even see it from the moment that Jesus comes to the earth as a little baby, and all of a sudden angels, 
they show us a picture of the atmosphere of heaven when the angels, this giant choir shows up in the middle of the sky, millions of angels perhaps, to a group of shepherds. And what are they singing? Glory to God in the highest. He's the man. We honor him. We celebrate him. That is the sound. That is the atmosphere that takes place in heaven. It's an atmosphere that God enjoys. Every time you see in scriptures where somebody has a vision, they see beyond this world and they see into that heavenly realm. You know what you'll find all the time? You'll find angels crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Right? You'll find people always falling down in their face. They're always falling down. And they're always getting back up and they get another view of, of who he is and they fall down all over again because they're overwhelmed at who he is. That's the picture of what angels do. God is enthroned between the angels, the Bible says, and you want to know what the angels are doing? All day long, night and day, they're getting a view of who God is and they keep repeating that view of this is what I see that God is like, whoa! And then they get back up. You ought to see what I'm seeing. Oh my goodness. Day and night, night and day, they honor him and they celebrate him and they thank him. That is the atmosphere. It's an atmosphere that God enjoys and we can cultivate. I know it sounds too simple. How do we draw near to God? You know, could it be God's word is true that it is simple as pausing in the midst of whatever your day is like and saying, Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you. Lord, thank you that you saved me. God, thank you for making me your child. Thank you that person that's being a jerk is going to go away someday. <laughs> or whatever it is. You find something to be thankful for. And when you thank him, you're actually inviting his presence into your life. Did you know that? Something as simple as a heartfelt, sincere thank you is inviting the very presence of God who made the world with his breath into the circumstances of your day. Simple, powerful. So create an atmosphere that he enjoys. I encourage you to do that. Psalms 104 says, enter, this is in the message, enter with a password, thank you. It says we enter his course with thanksgiving, enter his gates with praise. The message says it simply, enter with a password, thank you. It's how we enter into his presence. One of the Hebrew words for praise is we talk about giving Lord praise and thanks. And by the way, worship is not a song we sing. It's not an event that we attend. Worship is an entire life that is ascribing worth to God. That's what worship is. It's not a song we sing. It's not like, well, you know, we, when we sing fast and clap, that's not worship. When we, go, when we slow down, that's when it's worship. No, that is not worship. Worship is a whole life of ascribing that he's worthy. And part of worship is this word praise. And one of the Hebrew words for praise is the word hallel. It's where we get our word hallelujah from. And I want you to see how much this, this demands that we're engaged when we praise God. We should be fully engaged as we praise him. It means to burst forth, to boast in, to burst out in gratitude, to shout or to rave over. It demands a physical response that could look like bowing down, lifting up your hands, even whirling around. It's one of the words for praise is to whirl around. So if you see somebody whirling, maybe they're just really excited about who God is. And it demands a physical response. I think the house of God the church shouldn't look like a funeral home. You know what I mean? But I remember seeing a church sign that said, have trouble sleeping? We have sermons. <laughs> Why would you say that? The church, God being present with us, this should be the most exciting place on the planet to experience him. There should be shouts. There should be praise. There should be thanksgiving. There should be a few, woo! True praise, this is important because of what I just said, will always draw attention to the object of praise, not the praiser. True praise and worship is not drawing attention to me, not listening to how loud I can be or how flamboyant I can be. True praise is always putting the focus on him, not us. 
Let me end with this. How do we draw near to God together? I would simply say be quick to repent. Let us draw near to God. Let us come boldly into his presence with our guilty consciences cleansed through the blood of Jesus. We've got to be quick to repent. When, when most people sin, and this year, next year rather, we'll go through the book of 1 John together, and I'm really excited about doing that. And when we do, we'll find out that St. John said, I'm writing to this so that you don't sin. But if you do, you have an advocate, Jesus. He paid the penalty for your sins. So if you'll confess your sins before the Lord, he will be faithful and just to forgive you. So what I want to encourage you with as we land on this this morning is, is that if you sin, God's desire would be that you not sin. But if you do, you have an advocate, it's Jesus. For people, for most people, the response when they sin is they want to run away from God. When No, what you need to do is run toward him. You've got to run to him because you can't be made holy without him. So if you sin, be quick to repent. That's quick to turn from my sin and quick to run to him and let him cleanse you. Don't forget, the whole Bible is about him reaching out to you. He's not afraid of your sin. Your sin is the reason he came to cleanse us. His grace is so rich and so amazing. So we run, think of Matthew. Matthew was a tax collector. That means his job was to officially steal from God's people partnered with Rome, who occupied Jerusalem, and he was to take money for, on behalf of the Romans and rip them off and even take, he could take as much as he wanted. So while he was still in the tax collector's booth, doing what? Robbing people, stealing from God's people, being thoroughly hated by all the Jews, at that moment Jesus came to him and said, hey Matthew, follow me. He didn't say, Matthew, would you stop ripping people off? He knew if Matthew gets close to me, he's going to stop ripping people off. If he's going to come follow me, he's not going to be doing that anymore. When Isaiah stood before the, when he was present before the Lord's present, presence, he was right there. A man who was known as being godly, he was a prophet of God. He said, I'm undone. We need to restore and get to restoring the reverence for God. He said, I am undone. In other words, I feel worthless. And what did God do? God didn't say, yeah, you are. But he said, I'm a man of uncleanness. We better stop talking that way. No, God had an angel rush to him to touch his lips to cleanse him. I'm convinced if Isaiah would have said, oh, I'm a man of unclean hands, God would have rushed to his hands and cleansed them. If he said, I'm a man of unclean eyes, God would have rushed to his eyes to cleanse his eyes. So we come to Jesus as we are because he's the only one that can cleanse us. He's the only one that can make us what we could never make ourselves, and that's holy, more like him. Back in the day, I'll end with this thought. Back in the day, a coin, the value of a coin was shown by how much weight it had. And over time, coins get, they wear, they can grow thinner, even the face can be rubbed off somewhat, which means they're not worth as much. When Isaiah in God's presence said, I'm worthless, he didn't mean worthless like you and I think. He just meant, I'm worth less. Like a coin that has had the image somewhat rubbed off, it's, it's weared thin, it's just simply worth less than it used to be. It's possible in our lives that we could become not sensitive to the Holy Spirit. We could become insensitive to his presence. It's possible that through life, life happens and God's image put on our lives like a coin gets rubbed off and it wears thin. And what happens? We become worth less. We're just not worth as much anymore. I'm telling you, friend, it's only in coming to him that he restores his image to our life. That restores worth to our life. It will never be by going through hoops, trying to do whatever you think are all the right things. No, it's only coming to him who is worthy and having him pour worth back into us. Let's pray. Father in heaven, I thank you for, again, the privilege you've given us to gather in your house today. It is just that an honor. 
It's an honor that you would be right here in the midst of us today. You're not distant. You're not some far-off cosmic power. You are God who created the heavens and the earth who is with us, with us. And Lord, it's our desire that we would experience you being with us to the full capacity that is even humanly possible. You made us for this. You created us. It's why mankind's heart longs to know you. It's why you put eternity into the heart of every man. If you're here today and you would say, Pastor Kev, would you pray for me? I need to, I need to be born again. I need to have my sins forgiven. That's why Jesus came as a little baby, so that you would be saved. It's not enough to know all the right things about God. You can know about God. You can know that God's son is Jesus and that Jesus died for you. You can know that Jesus rose from the dead, but until you receive his sacrifice on your behalf, the knowing doesn't do you any good. Having the head knowledge does you no good. When they talk about people being saved, saved from what? From an eternity in hell. Hell was never created for you. It was created for the devil and his angels. But our refusal to receive what Jesus did for us would land us in what the Bible calls the dungeons of the damned. But we can experience life. I mean eternal life, abundant life now, and the best that is still yet to come, all by simply placing our faith in Jesus. So today... As we get toward the end of this year, if you would say, Pastor, will you pray for me? I want to receive what Jesus did for me. I want to be forgiven of my sins. I, too, want to be adopted into that family, God's family. If that's you, I'm going to count to three. And when I say three, I'm going to ask you to raise your hands just as fast as you can because I want to see who I'm going to pray with today. Are you ready without any delay? One, two, three. Just shoot your hand up and wave that. Will you all across this auditorium? Thank you, friend. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. How many more? Real quickly. Thank you. I see you. Real quickly, in the balcony, all across this auditorium. If that's you, if you wave it, it'll help me see you. Thank you. Thank you. I should put my glasses on. That helped. Thank you. Right now, for all those that, uh, that raised their hands, those I saw, those I didn't see, the Lord saw you. I'm going to have us pray right where we are. Often I like you to come down. I want to see you in the eyeball, but there's something else I want to do this morning. So right where you're seated, right where you're seated, if you're watching this online, I'm with you all the way. Pray with me. If you raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me, I want you to repeat this prayer with me. I'm going to ask that all of us would repeat this together, okay? Will you pray this with me? Say this with me. Say, Father in heaven, I thank you for your son Jesus. I believe that he died, was buried, and he rose from the dead. Jesus, you gave your life for me, so I give my life to you. Everything that I am and all that I hope to be, I belong to you. I turn from my sin, and I'm turning to you. And I thank you, Jesus, that my sins are forgiven. I'm adopted into your family, and I've got a brand new start in life. That begins right now. Amen. Give the Lord a hand, will you please? Thank you for praying with me. Before you leave this place, I hope you uh, tell somebody, I pray that prayer with Pastor Kev. I would encourage you, please, before you go, come down front. I'd love to say hello. I'd love to meet you. I certainly want to get a gift in your hand. A little book that I wrote to help you on this great journey you're on. I hope you join us at what we call Growth Track. It takes place right up where you see that red banner. After every Sunday, we want to just help grow in Christ together. I want us to do one more thing before we're officially dismissed. If you have to go, I'll respect. You have to go do what you have to. Some of you have to go to work, whatever that is. But, but if we can do this in a culture that is filled with everything fast, we want to get in and get out. In the middle of that culture, it, it, it feels wrong to me to talk about the potential of being in God's presence without me looking at you in the eye and say, okay, come on guys, let's go do that. If it was a message about you personally going to experience God, I would say, go home and do that. 
but today it was, let us do that together. So let's do that together. All that other stuff, that'll still be there. We'll get to that. Could there be anything more important than encountering God together? Experiencing God together. Some of you have carried guilt and weight and God's going to lift that. So many beautiful things can happen in his presence. He'll lift that off of you. Others of you hear about joy and it's something that you wish someday you would ever, you'd be able to experience. It's possible for you today. Others of you in God's presence because he's so creative, he will give you creative ideas. Solutions will be downloaded into your life. They will propel your business, the place that you work. Amazing things happen in his presence. So I know it's probably not possible for all of us to fit down here, but I would, I would ask you to come because it's let's together. So I'm going to ask you to come. As many of you can fit, let's come down together, down front. This is a big church. There's plenty of space. If you need space, you can spread way out. But would you please stand and come? Let's approach the Lord together before we get out of this place today. Again, feel free to spread out. If you need space, that's, that's beautiful. That's fine. There's lots of space. How do we, how do we tap into, how do we reach out and touch God to experience the full potential that is inside of us? Well, first, we do it together. You're here. It's first step. Here we are. Let us do this together. Will you decide with me that even when everything within you, because of the business, busyness of life, or whatever it is, makes you want to lean the other way, will you lean into community with God's family? Will you lean into that? It's part of what God made for you. I grew up going to church because we had to go to church. Eventually I learned, oh, I don't have to. I get to be with a family. Would you lean into that? Secondly, will you, will you join me? And let's, how do we enter his place? How do we enter his presence? We create an atmosphere that he's really comfortable in. This is an atmosphere that says, Lord, thank you. So whatever that's going to sound like coming out of you, I don't want to over-direct or lead this moment, then you just let that come out of you. Would you let some thanksgiving? What are you thankful for? What good has God done for you? Loud enough so you can hear your own voice. Would you right where you are say, Lord, thank you. Thank you. God, I thank you. We practice the password, thank you. God, I thank you for saving me. I thank you for loving me, for disciplining me, for being kind to me, for rescuing me, protected me so many times, Lord. Thank you. Guarded me so many times. You protected me from others. You protected me from myself, Lord. Thank you. Thank you for coming as a little baby. God, thank you. I love your friend. 
and nearer and nearer and closer and closer draw me nearer and nearer pull me closer and closer Lord and draw me nearer and nearer draw me closer and closer Hello, and thank you for joining us. I hope you enjoyed that message of hope and have been encouraged in your relationship with Jesus Christ. What is the next step God's asking you to take? I would encourage you to check out Growth Track. It's our delight to come along your side and help you reach your full kingdom potential. To give now, you can simply click Give on our website or text any amount to 84321. It is your faithful giving that allows us to continue to preach the gospel and make disciples from our neighborhoods to the nations of the world. Thank you and God bless you.